Five questions to ask your cover crop seed dealer. Um, the reason we, we want to talk about this is uh, I, I really want to make this for everyone involved in the cover crop seed business, not just the farmers who buy the seed, but for those who are educators or influencers, uh, agronomists, whoever you are, uh, and even cover crop seed dealers, because we have uh, several actually in our group, to be able to do a transaction that benefits all. So uh, I put out, I think, in one of my emails or my Facebook posts that this isn't try to help you get a sweet deal with your cover crop seed dealer. That's not my motivation to do this here. Uh, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, I just want us to ask the right questions so that we understand what we're doing, what we're getting, and our expectations are met. So uh, before we get into the questions, though, I have, uh, I guess, a little bit of context here because we have all different types of people in the way they deal and the way they do business. And I just put a couple categories here. Are you a price shopper or are you a loyal customer? And and that's kind of a you know wide range of uh, you know of, of of different types of people that are out there. Uh, but in the context here of the of the questions to ask, I'm just laying it out there mainly for uh, maybe a person who's selling the seed. They generally understand uh, who their customers are once they get to know them. Uh, but and the other part of this is does if you're if you're buying cover crop seed. Do you tend to really look at the value or you just look at price? And this may be the most important thing to consider uh, because I think we all know that price doesn't always dictate the best deal. And you know who you are. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't have to pick out names or anything. Uh, and it's not right or wrong. That's what I want to say. I just want to get this out as a foundation for all involved to hopefully that we can make a uh, a more informed decision when we are uh, actively purchasing, pursuing uh, our cover crop needs, our cover crop buys. So let's get started here. The first question I have to ask your cover crop seed dealer is just to have a conversation of what do they know about this seed? Uh, is it is it a brand? Or is it a variety? And we've discussed this a couple different times in several previous uh, webinars that we've done. But uh, simply put, a variety is a specific genetic selection that has been designated as a variety. It is unique. From a scientific perspective, there's nothing else out there like it. It's different than anything else out there. That's what they have to do to have a, a variety. Now, varieties can be so similar, you can't tell them apart. Uh, but scientifically, there would be some distinction. If it's awarded a variety, it has to be proven that it's unique and different. A brand is whatever the company claims is in that bag and what it will do. So you can have several different types of, uh, you could actually have different varieties. You could have mixes of varieties, just as long as it supports the advertisement of what you do. And so I'll just leave it at that right now because we did cover that really much in depth here not too long ago. We talked about VNS cover crop seed and so forth. And that brings up VNS, or variety not stated. When you don't have a variety stated, and there's a lot of good reasons for that, and I'll just say it's neither good or bad. You just need to know what you're getting. So this is why you need to have a conversation with your seed dealer. If you have no experience with this seed, uh, what 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 do you know about it? How can I trust it? You know, all those you just ask these questions in order to be able to <clears throat> to get what you're expecting. And then is it certified seed? And certified is always associated with a variety, and it is it's it's actually checked out three different times by a third party agency. Uh, in my case here in Pennsylvania, it's the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Uh, that's who the seed uh, division is is under. Where when I plant a seed for certified, and I'm just just telling you exactly what I'm doing. I'm growing Cossack black oats as certified seed. I planted it last October. It's a winter oats. Okay, so I told the certifying 
people what I did. They came and looked at the field after it was up, and they're just looking for any abnormalities that may be present. Uh, is there there's a taller plants here and there, shorter plants that look like the variety may not be pure. Then uh, before harvest, they come and they look at the field, and uh, they did this about uh, a couple days. It was a couple days before harvest here, just a couple weeks ago. And I had a few areas around the edge of the field that had some triticale growing that was volunteer. So they would, they told me on a map, do not include that. And then now, actually, actually right now, um, they're coming. Uh, my son's going over there right now. They're coming to check the clean seed. They will take a sample of it and make sure the seed sample is good. I'm using this example so you understand what certified seed is. Certified seed is a little more rigorous, this is more third-party validation, and theoretically, it should be better, it should be more pure, and all that. That doesn't mean you need to buy certified seed all the time. I'm just helping us understand here, when you, when, when, when you see a seed for sale in a booklet or an online, and you're like, okay, this is, uh, let's just say it's black oats. Uh, let's use my example here. And you would call up and say, okay, what's the, is it a variety? They might say, yes, it is. Well, what's the variety name? And if it does have a variety name, you can research it, and, or they can tell you what the traits are and so forth. If it's a VNS, then you can say, well, what do you know about it? Is there any history to this VNS, variety not stated? And they might say, oh, it's an awesome variety that so-and-so is growing down here. It really works well in this region, and and you know you ought to try it and that's fair enough whatever you whatever you think there or they could say we don't know where it's from and if they say that well then you buy it at your own risk uh so this is some of the questions you want to ask and and uh in this whole uh conversation so uh try to get a general sense of the history if you don't know anything about it now if you're dealing with a what i would call a trusted seed dealer could be someone you actually know someone you've bought from for the last five years, you certainly don't have to ask all these questions if you if you if you trust them and what they're going to tell you. But it makes it makes you uh, a, a better, more informed purchaser when you know the right questions to to be able to ask. Um, so pushing us a little bit further, what is on the seed tag? Every seed that is sold, uh, even farmer to farmer, and again, I have a webinar on how to grow your own cover crop seed legally. Uh, so you can you can go back and look at that if you want to know more about that. But even so, you you are required by law to get the seed tested and put a seed tag along with it. And on that seed tag, there's several key important things that do, is helpful information. So the key ones are the germination, the percent of germination from the test, the purity meaning how pure is it? If it's cereal rye, is there any wheat mixed in with it or any triticale mixed in with it? Or could be hairy vetch. That's a common thing that can get in cereal rye sometimes. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, for instance, if I was buying cereal rye, let's just say it maybe was from a neighbor or whatever, and it had 2% hairy vetch, I would be like, awesome. That's some real cheap hairy vetch seed I'm buying right there. Uh, so just because it's not pure doesn't mean it's no good. Now, if uh, I'm buying wheat, uh, I guess that wouldn't be a good example for cover crop, but if there's hairy vetch in wheat, that's not a good thing. Uh, you can spray it out, but that's that's considered a weed if it's cash green wheat, so that's just an example there. So <clears throat> every, every seed sort of has its, or every seed company sometimes has their own standards. I mean, to get 100% purity sometimes is difficult, if not impossible. So don't 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 throw a big fit if you see it's not 100% pure, because sometimes that's impossible. And uh, sometimes the purity in it also includes inert or dirt. Uh, it could be wh whatever. Sometimes there's some uh, that that could come along with it, or or uh, like chaff. There's a certain amount allowed in there. But if you see the inert is like more than 1% or 2%, then, then there's like, okay, that needs to be factored in in the price here because I don't want to buy chaff, uh, you know. Or But but the, the worst thing could be the noxious weeds. And you there's two different levels of weeds in seed tag. The one is noxious weeds, 
and noxious is a weed that is kind of just um it's just not supposed to be there prohibited weeds are ones like johnson grass or um uh, and, and it depends. Each state has their list of prohibited. Obviously, uh, they can't be in there. Now, there are some allowances somewhere sometimes for very, very, very small amount of prohibited weeds, but that's very rare. Now, noxious weeds, there is usually an allowance, and it may be listed as five seeds per pound, or like morning glory would be a noxious weed in most all states. And I didn't look this up beforehand, but uh, every state has their limits to the degree of noxious weeds that are allowed. Now, if I'm buying something and I've and, and I've had you know just spent 20 years getting rid of, um, let's just say Morning Glory, and I see that there's 20 seeds per pound of Morning Glory uh, <clears throat> in this Sun Hemp seed I'm buying, which by the way is a problem. Uh, it's very difficult to get morning glory seed out of sun hemp. Uh, I'm going to say, I don't think I want that seed. Uh, so so this is why you, you want to know what the noxious is. Now, it's just you need to know, you take the risk. I bought seed already. I've looked at noxious, and I thought it had some in there. I was like, oh, that's no big deal. Um, I can take care of that. I'm willing to. It's just not going to be a factor. So, again, it's all about understanding the risks that go with this and then understanding you know, that's just no big deal. I'm just going to do it for it. Um, the other thing is uh, the date tested. Uh, that is important. Most, I should say, all states have a date assigned to the date when it was tested to the date when it can be sold. And depending on the crop, that could be six months, nine months, or one year. I'm not sure if there's any more than one year. But if you uh, want to be picky over the phone, you could say, well, what's the seed tag? Say, when was this tested? And if it's something like peas, peas learn lose their germ quickly, kind of like soybeans. You carry soybeans over the next year. That's pretty risky. Uh, and I would never buy peas that aren't retested uh, more than nine months old. Uh, I just would never do it. Uh, it, it just that is way too far, too high a risk. There may be certain pea varieties out there that are better, but that's an example. They go downhill quickly. Uh, so I have some examples down there that say radish, and your ryegrass, hairy vetch. They keep their germ long. Actually, um, those three radish, and your ryegrass, hairy vetch actually pick up germination. And in year one or two after harvest. Now, what is not required to be listed on a T tag is when it was harvested. Um, it's just not required. And uh, so it's kind of irrelevant in a way. But if you really, really want to drill down, I would prefer to plant two year old hairy vetch because the hard seed that's typically in hairy vetch will start to uh, get, uh, there'll be less of it, and you'll have more viable seeds for that year. Radish seeds are really good. I had my, I have had several tests come back with radishes, and I've seen hundreds of them, that have been 100% germination. One of them was four years past harvest. Radish holds its germ really good. Annual ryegrass is really good, as I said. Uh, crimson clover is, is decent, uh, but just, just, the important piece here to know is um, when was it last tested? So uh, there is rules in place, but I'm telling you, there are some cover crop seed companies that they try to get away with stuff and they don't update their tests. And um, you just want to know what's going on there in that regard. Uh, at least ask them the question. The final thing on the seed tag, and not all seed tags have this, but uh, the seeds per pound, this is more relevant if you're thinking about doing some sort of precision planting, like singulating the seeds, like you can do with radishes, hairy vetch. Um, you can even do it with sorghum sedan. Some of these guys are using milo plates to plant this stuff. Um, and and you, it's nice to know the seeds per pound because you're going to be planting it based on a population basis. And you have... Um, Hairy vetch seeds that can range from like 12,000 seeds per pound to 20,000 seeds per pound. 
radishes can range from 19,000 seeds per pound. I've seen them up to 50,000 seeds per pound on some uh, grayed out type radishes that I've seen. And essentially that seed size generally does not make a whole lot of difference genetically, but you may see a, um, uh, it, it, it could really differ. It could really factor into your cost per acre if you have smaller seeds of a given selection, a given variety, or what have you. So, if you really want to fine tune things, and I say this usually to save some money on the one end, but also if you're buying large radish seeds and you're paying by the pound, you're not getting as many plants as you may think you are. Now, then it might vary 10, 15, 20 percent, but it adds up over bigger acres. So. It's something good to know. More people are doing this now, uh, printing on the tag, uh, the seeds per pound. So it's something to look for if it's there uh, to help maybe your management. If you're just drilling it, um, again, it could affect the seeding rate. Smaller seeds per pound, what you're used to, you could actually uh, cut your seeding rate back a little bit and get the same number of stands. So this kind of leads up to question number three. What is the cost per acre? That's the bottom line, right? Um, and when when you're talking about value, usually we we take the seeding rate times the price. Um, so if you have different, let's say you have different options, like like now there's if you if you have a a, a seed company that has a large portfolio of seeds, they may have uh, two different types of vetches. Uh, they may have a couple different types of radishes. Uh, they may, you know, whatever, and uh, peas, what have you. So just try to get a little idea of what the cost is per acre. And, of course, on a mix as well. The farmers usually do this, but if you're really trying to fine-tune things and get your, you know, sharpen your pencil, what is the cost per acre is is a great question to ask. Now, you can deduce that yourself by, by uh, you know, getting the seeding rate and the price, but it's sometimes just a, a helpful question to ask. Let's move on to question number four. What do I need to know in order to grow this cover crop? So if it's something you're unfamiliar with, just ask the question, what are, what, what are some helpful uh, pointers here? You know, what do I need to know? And uh, any cover crop seed dealer that is, um, actively involved should know when the planting window is they should know key termination timings or, or options uh, they should know how it reacts in a mix if you want to mix uh, now if a if, if you're buying a mix and then you want to add some other species to it you're going to have to figure some stuff out by yourself but I'm going to use the radishes as an example here uh, when you're creating mixes, you never put more than two pounds of radish in any mix, regardless of how many species they are, because they, they grow so fast, they can outcompete. And um, so if you have two species or if you have 20 species, never do more than two pounds of radish. And so that's just a little example there of what you need to know in order to grow this cover crop, especially if you're doing mixes and so forth. So an awful lot of questions can be asked there. It's kind of an obvious one, but it's all helpful, I think, when I said at the very beginning, are you uh, a loyal customer or are you just a price shopper? If you're just a price shopper, you can uh, you know feel free to ask all these questions, but cover crop seed companies sometimes if they know you to be that type of person they're not going to give you as to spend as much time uh, they're not going to spend a half hour on the phone with you if they know you're just trying to mine information from them in order to go out and buy the cheapest seed somewhere so i would say on behalf of the cover crop seed companies respect their time uh, respect their value that they offer so if you're working with a, a company that is, is pretty much um, just sells on price, uh, you know, just understand that you may not get the amount of information from it. So I'm just I'm just putting this out there as a perspective when you're out shopping around for cover crop seeds. 
Another in here that it sounds a little too simplistic, but I thought it was it, it warranted the top five is uh, ask your, the, the, your, your seed dealer the availability of seed. Don't take for granted that they actually have what you called about a month ago. Uh, I've had this happen. I've heard about it. I've had it happen myself where I made a phone call and you have this. Yep, we got it. And then I'm like, okay, I'm ready to plant. Oh, sorry, we're sold out. Like, what? I thought you said you had it. Well, we did. Uh, but somebody came in here and took it all. Okay, well, that happens. Um, and and stepping into the cover crop seed dealer's shoes, if you're talking to them in, in good time, which you should be, state your intentions. And uh, I, I always think it's good to be up front. Uh, and if you're price shopping, just say, hey, I'm just checking around, checking the availability. Uh, but... If, if you're going to be a long-term customer and you'll, you'll say that, you know, if I get my corn off by the end of September, I'd like to try to plant some hairy vetch. Do you think you'll have any for then? And they may say, oh, we got plenty of hairy vetch. Or they may say, you know, we're really running short. The only way I can guarantee it is if I hold it for you. Uh, so then you'll have to work something out on that. My whole point here is just ask the simple question. Are you long or are you short on this seed that I'm interested in? Because I fully understand that uh, you, depending on the weather, depending when you get things off, you don't want to buy cover crop seed if you may not get it planted because of weather delays or what have you. So just a conversation with your seed dealer of your expectations, I think it's very prudent um, to to do that. So, um I think I'm going to just pause right here and ask if there's any questions. I do have uh, one bonus thing to add here, uh, but I'm going to open up uh, the microphones for everybody. So any uh, comments or, or questions that you might have, I might have to mute a few people here that uh, are a little bit loud. But uh, uh, anyway, any comments or, or questions from anybody uh, on this topic? See, yeah, this is Don. Based on number five and one of the others previous to that, like with vets, mm -hmm. if you had good type storage, uh, you know, that was where you could yes. store correctly, would it be advisable to buy vets a couple years in advance? If you can afford that and can store it well, the mice don't get in it, there's no harm in that. I do know of some farmers who were buying cover crop seeds a year in advance for some of those reasons because they've been burned where they they didn't it, it they ran out of seed or whatever so if you can afford to do that and can store it well in a good location the answer would be yes something like vetch radishes uh and your ryegrass uh there's probably other ones there that i'm not thinking of right now but um not many people are probably going to do that but i do know some people who are buying their cover crop seeds a year in advance i have heard of it great question uh, other questions from anybody? Comments? Hey, Steve, this is Lloyd. Uh, yeah, Lloyd. Uh, in my area here, there's really nobody that wants to talk cover crops. I mean, our conversations is about the extent of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, different people, uh, dealers have it. Mm -hmm. But when you say, okay, now, you know, you know my soil, or you know, you know our area, and uh, you know what what will work best, or yes, the for your your questions, mm -hmm. and you know, you get the uh, you know the salute. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I don't know. I think I think yeah. it's going to get better um, moving forward. I, I would hope so. Um, and by the way, Lloyd, I do have your black oats here that you requested about six weeks ago. Okay. So I'm just kind of proving my point here. Lloyd asked for some of the black oats. I have it set aside. It's cleaned. It's bagged. I'm get, It's getting tested today as I speak. Once I get the test back, then uh, you're welcome to come get it. So there's a real live example for you all happening right in front of you today. <laughs> so was this set up, Steve? No, it wasn't. It was not <laughs> set up, Dan. Uh, okay. Trust me. Trust me. It just worked out well. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll catch Steve. It yeah. Go ahead. Steve, this is this is Cody talking. Um, say we've actually you talk about price per acre. Yeah. 
And that's really opened the door up a lot. Yeah. I actually generated a, a new calculator, a mix calculator that we're cool. using. And it is based on price per acre and it actually ties in with the NRCS calculator. Oh, good. And now the fact that we have that ability, mm -hmm. uh, when, when we can talk price per acre, I mean, that is, you know, the first question has got to be, what's your resource concern? What are you trying to accomplish? But then the second one is, is what do you want to spend? You yeah. know, some guys might only want to spend 12 bucks an acre. Some mm -hmm. guys are willing to spend 30 mm -hmm. and well, yeah. You know, you get everybody in between there and we can really play with that and tweak it and think we can put together a good blend for mm -hmm. any one of those situations, yeah. you know, so that yeah. that's been a huge value here this year yeah. for for us as a company. Yeah. So Cody's with Prairie Creek Seeds, uh, pretty much Minnesota, Iowa, and I don't know where all you get around, uh, Cody, but you guys are doing. A yeah, awesome Iowa, job. Wisconsin and and uh, Dakotas and Nebraska. Yep, you guys are doing an awesome job out there with the cover crop market. So uh, that's really, really good to hear. Um, now, I don't know. I, I see Ken Becker's on here. Ken, your microphone is very loud. I don't know if you're hearing this. Um, but if you want, I would appreciate hearing any comments you have as a seed dealer. Yeah, cover crops, the cost per acre is a big concern. All right. And uh, just echo, echo. You want to know what they're trying to accomplish with it? Right. Are they That's, trying to cover? Are they trying to make feed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ken is with um, Homestead Nutrition here, based in southeastern Pennsylvania. They go cover the Mid Atlantic region, and actually, I got to say that I believe you were Homestead Nutrition was one of my first cover crop dealers when I got into business back in 2004. So. Uh, it's been uh, good working with you guys and uh, and so forth. So uh, yeah, we appreciate. It. Yeah, good. So, anybody uh, other comments here from anybody else? Question. Yes, Steve, it's Don again. Yeah. I'd like to ask Cody which NRCS calculator he's using. Go ahead, Cody. Yeah. So actually, we I I'm using the it was one from Minnesota that we got. Um, and actually it was last year, so it's already outdated um, for that. It does still work if it works for la the way I understand it. If it worked for last year's calculator, it still qualifies. So I got to get that all updated. And then what we did is we kind of used that and used some of those calculations and then added in some columns so I could figure out the price. And so I put in my entire price sheet and then was able to generate the price per acre off of that. So I had to have a I guess an Excel specialist kind of do that because it was pretty in depth. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's, you know, it's not something we're we're just kind of using it as a tool to to so we can do it as we move forward. Um, kind of as a last year, I, I I would use that calculator and then I would send down the blends that we put together mm -hmm. to our warehouse and then have you know have the office manager get me a quote on it and come back. Well, now it's like, now I can do it real time. Mm. So it just makes it a lot quicker and we can adjust it on the go a lot quicker. And just kind of, as you can tweak it, you can make that cheaper, you know, whether you're going to add certain things to, to get the price down. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I believe we probably need to do this with every state because I'm, if I'm not mistaken, every state's got a different calculator. Is that correct? Well, I was going to say here in Indiana, we developed, we've developed a calculator uh basically it works backwards um it's developed to to basically you to tell it what you want the final leaf coverage to be in your stand and then it works the it works the uh ratio backwards uh to based on size of seed and all that kind of stuff to, to develop the you tell it you want it 10 percent radish and 20 percent this and 10 percent that and that's all based on final leaf coverage and uh then it tells you how many pounds the acre to plant and then you're telling it that's all based on a on a baseline of of it being drilled and if you're going to do it aerial seeded you, you bump it up if you're going to do it with a fertilizer spreader you bump it up and all that kind of stuff um, yeah i didn't know if it was a similar kind of calculator or not yeah yeah no it's it, it sounds very similar to that because it's all based off of uh, percentages of well this one's based off of percentages of recommended seeding rate and then you can go down and and in the tab and say you want to put radishes and you know minnesota had a outlandish rate of 12 pounds of radishes per acre 
for oh. for a seating rate. So you always run them at you know below ten percent. Yeah, um, I, I, heard, I heard that's what Steve used to recommend. That's correct. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. You stand corrected. It was thirteen pounds. That oh, was okay. the original <laughs> rate, thirteen pounds per acre. And boy, did we have great weed control. Just saying. <laughs> anyway, no, it came way back down to six. Then Dan, just for the for the record. <laughs> yeah, this is. This is Aaron from the NRCS. Um, yeah. You're right. There are different calculators for every state. So just to clarify. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's that's all. This is great. Great conversation here. Um, any other quick Steve? questions before we uh, move on to my bonus uh, thing? Yes. Go ahead. Well, it's a question and a comment. Sure. Um, I, I've seen too many cases where you know the farmer comes into the seed dealer and tells them what he wants to do but the one of the key questions that's not asked is well when are those fields going to be harvested mm -hmm. and I, i've just seen too many times where guys are planting radishes notes annual ryegrass in october mm -hmm. and it's it's you know it's too late mm -hmm. and those two weeks in september yeah. are are huge oh, and yeah. and you, you got to reinforce with the growers you know and again it's by field and by what you know what variety that they're, they're mm -hmm. of the corn or soybeans are going to be out yeah. there yeah it, it it goes back to how you're going to seed it and yeah. with your timing yeah well this is where uh good i'll say it this way good cover crop seed dealers are having a year-round discussion with their customers. If they need to help the farmers, uh, which now there's a lot of farmers kind of asking the questions, getting on the bandwagon. The innovative farmers pretty much take care of themselves. They know that they got to be thinking about cover crops a year in advance. Uh, so if, if you're a good cover crop seed dealer, you're going to be helping them think through, do you want to plant a shorter season corn or bean so we can set ourselves up potentially getting those two weeks in September that we so desperately need. Or as in now, what seems to be creeping up, it looks like there's going to be an early harvest in, in a decent part of the corn belt. So right now, it's in July when this is being recorded, uh, that's, starting to come, that's starting to come into focus. So if I was a cover crop seed dealer or if I was a farmer, I'm thinking, you know what, maybe I can plant radishes this year. I might be shelling corn on September the 10th. And those are the kind of questions where, you know, I'm speaking to both the farmers here, and I'm speaking to also the cover crop dealers that you want to take advantage of um, in, a, in a very good way. It's a good benefit. So, yeah, it's, it's all about this education and everything. What Steve, one question? note on that, I can, I, mm -hmm. I can tell there's been a lot of improvement on, with a lot of the farmers in terms of planning ahead this year as opposed to years past. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of folks that have called ahead and said, you know, we're looks like we're going to be chopping silage the 20th of August here in Minnesota, which has never happened before. Okay. Um, is there something we can do and let's yep. get mixes put together and let's, yep. let's be, let's have seed waiting for us when we're yep. done. Absolutely. That's never happened before. That's good. That's a sign of the maturing of the industry. I think Dan, you were going to say something. Um, Oh yeah, now I forgot what it you was. You need to drink another cup of coffee and then get back. I'm, to I'm, I, I know it was a good question. I'm sure it was. <laughs> well, listen, let's go. Let's go to my bonus one here, and then we'll get back to you, Dan. Okay? So you be thinking about it here. My my uh, my bonus uh, question to ask is: um, Can I get a discount for early prepay now? I'm not trying to be smart here. Uh, I've been on the seed selling side and it's really nice in March when a farmer calls up and say, you know, I got uh bush wondering, you know, do you have any programs for early prepay or, you know, early order uh, and so forth. And it, it's nice to lock that in. And it is a value to everyone involved, the cover crop seed dealer and the farmer. Not all farmers have the cash to do that, uh, but it's a good question to ask if you do, or if nothing else, just to give a pre-order, there may be a small discount for something like that. So that's my bonus question. 
is there a discount for early prepay or I could say early order or something? And and again, some companies say, well, we don't have a program like that. But if enough people ask, they probably will. Uh, put yourself in the cover crop seed dealer's shoes. How much seed do they need to buy in in order to have it for you when you want to plant it? It's nice to get a little temperature of the demand out there, and this is one way to do it. Because if uh, more and more people are, are inquiring earlier, you, you'll you'll pretty much know the demand is probably going to be higher. So that's that's my bonus question. Uh, ask if there's an if there's, there's some sort of early order discount or early order uh, or prepay. So uh, now I'll go back to Dan to see if Dan's thought about the question he was going to ask. Yes, I have. Steve. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, this is just. Uh, it, it, I'm just curious if it, anybody else has observed this, but in mature systems, i.e. you guys have been using covers for more than five years, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like a number of them are able to reduce their, their yeah. seeding population, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sometimes fairly significantly. Mm -hmm. and, and again, they know what they're doing and they know mm -hmm. what, what they're, what they're, what they want, and, but mm -hmm. and, and no particular cover crop, but just in general, mm -hmm. they can, seems like they can get by with mm -hmm. uh, planting less seed. Mm -hmm. I'll comment on that than I'd like anyone else to. Um, I'll say this, that Harry Vetch, I think is a, is a classic example. The, the first year of planting Harry Vetch, if your field's never seen Harry Vetch, you want your seeding rate to be you know, whatever they tell you, 20, 25 pounds per acre. But when you go the next time, if again, if it's a single species, you could probably go down to 15, 12 pounds per acre. Uh, it just, once the inoculant is there, uh, now, now again, you're going to be inoculating your seed anyway, but I'm just saying there's something goes on, it makes it easier to grow. But I think, Dan, you hit it there when you said it's not just that you can reduce the seeding rate uh, just because the crop was grown there before the cover crop, it's because you know how to manage it better. You know how to plant it better. And so I think that's something that farmers need to pay attention to uh, in, in, in observing how things are going. And uh, you're exactly right. The, the seeding rate typically does or can go down in a more mature system, but it still depends on what you're trying to accomplish Obviously, right. if it's forage, you're going to have to keep your rates up to 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 you know capitalize on that part. But uh, so, anyone else have a comment on on seeding rates um, into a mature system? This is Don. I think I think it's it's more of a not you're reducing it. It's more that you're micromanaging the rates for mm -hmm. what you want it to do. Sure. Uh, you you can get by going up or going down. You're comfortable going up. You're comfortable going down. If I want to go out here and I want total weed control, I want to raise those rates up, and I'm comfortable mm. planning into those rates. Right. And uh, but if I think this year, hey, you know, man, it, it's money's a little tight, and it's going to be this fall. Money's going to be a little tight. I can I I can comfortable bringing them down if I if for for particular reasons. Right. So I think it's more about micromanaging rates based on resource needs. And and also what you're trying to accomplish, as you indicated. So. Uh, and actually, as we've been uh, on this webinar, uh, money's not going to be quite so tight because uh, Trump has announced there's going to be uh, 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 farmers are going to get compensated for the trade disputes. So <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't well, saw thanks, that. Thanks for that dollars. update. That's great. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, but it's it, it's something that you know to, to to stay tuned for that's that's for sure <laughs> uh, breaking news right here on the webinar that's awesome okay i see uh john is on from western canada or western new york sorry uh john uh john uh, just john cameraman any comments you have on this topic anything to add no i think price price is what a lot of people are really looking at and, mm -hmm. uh most of the crops in New York are quite late, but really mostly looking pretty good in our area. Western New York was very dry, but they got a lot of rain this week. So yeah. good. Looking better. Okay. I'm going to um, just move ahead a little bit. We'll open it up. I'll open it up for questions here momentarily. Um, I, I did a poll last week. Some of you might've seen this on Twitter. 
where I ask, you can see what it says there, seems that many areas of crops are ahead of schedule, and I'm pretty much targeting the Midwest here. And it's interesting to see that 56% of the 81 votes said it looks like it's going to be sooner than normal. So over half are looking at an earlier, um, I'm, I'm looking at it this way, an earlier plant date for cover crops. So uh, that leads me to say that our next next week, our topic is going to be cover crop options for an earlier than expected planting window. And so I thought it was a very timely to put that in there. And then it was interesting that this morning I, I get various emails from different sources. Uh, Ag Web had this out, uh, crop progress, if harvest came early, would you be ready? Now, I actually didn't take time to read the article. I'm not sure if they mentioned cover crops in this article about plantium, but I just wanted to say that it does look like we're getting early. So let's let's not waste an opportunity here. Uh, to get some cover crops planted uh, because uh, we don't get this every year. We certainly didn't have it last year. So in order just to wrap up our time here today, uh, any other cover crop question at all that you've been thinking about? It certainly still could be with what we're uh, uh, talking about here today in the cover crop uh, questions to ask cover crop seed dealers. Is there any other cover crop question that you've been uh, wanting to ask the group? Uh, go ahead. Well, this is Don again. I, I would I would like to if Cody's calculator is public information. I'd like it to look at it if that was possible. Well, I'll I'll leave that up to Cody. Um, I'm I'm assuming that's your 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 business stuff there, Cody. So that's all. Yeah, Don. We can talk. We can talk afterwards if that's all right. Yep. Um, Steve, can you get us hooked up together? I can. Yep. I'll okay. Jump at that tone. Yep. Yep. I'll do that. Happy to do that. Other questions? Hey, hey Steve. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, Go ahead, Ken. The questions they asked your cover crop dealer talked about cost and what you're trying to do. But a good question to ask your cover crop dealer is what is the benefits I'm going to see from doing this? Because mm -hmm. uh, many times mm -hmm. in some wet swamp areas, we have people that are able to plant in good, no till in good conditions where they're neighbors using different systems is too wet and they can't get in mm -hmm. and then you know in this first first week of may that's a pretty important value to the farm right now it's that's a that's a good a good one to add to the to the list of questions there because and then that's where you know it takes time to develop knowledge in specific applications of specific cover crops so that's why if you're serious about cover crops as a farmer, you need to learn. You need to ask the questions. You need to try. If you're serious about cover crops as a educator, same thing. You need to learn. You need to find out that one size usually never fits all. Some, some exceptions to that. If you're a cover crop seed dealer, you need to learn about your customers and, and what, what – do they have well-drained fields? Do they have – uh, wet fields that can all determine because you want them to have the best experience. So, uh, you know, cover crops are not an afterthought, and it it just comes back to the same basics that we know that you there's a lot of information you need to know to make them work well. And I I still feel I've been saying this for a couple of years. Maybe I should graduate, but we're still in kindergarten. Maybe we're in first grade now. I'm not sure, but when you think of the the long of the long term um history of agriculture this cover crop thing is has has really just been re-looked at here in the last decade or so and uh, so a lot to learn yet that's for sure so great question other other questions from anybody Steve, Go ahead, Lloyd. with regards uh with regards to wet fields uh i never read anywhere or you know in my researches uh that suggested plant this or that to in your wet spots or your wet fields a uh, uh, guy I work with uh, I mean all his farms are you know severely wet and uh, uh, you know he had dry this past year and uh, he couldn't get into his fields until the end of June well with uh, you have winter rye or annual rye uh, winter cereal mm -hmm. yeah well it was a wet year and, and it was 
I, you know, we planted corn for a neighbor who was, it was June the 15th. It was triticale in that case. It was actually starting to turn. Was, I think the seeds might have been viable. And it's just a wet field. And um, it's how wet it was around here in the spring. I mean, there's always extremes. We we had that around here this year. Uh, but so, I will. I, I, my, go ahead. Yeah, my question is, is there, uh, should, I, should I focus on certain, uh, types for wet wetter fields that are traditionally wet well ideally if you ever have like in a sometimes in a prevent plant situation where it was just too wet to even think about planting uh waiting until it eventually does dry out which it usually does over summer and planting uh some aggressive rooting type cover crops like the radishes like annual ryegrass uh, like maybe this time of the year where they can they can have plenty of time to root deeply. I have heard, I haven't experienced this myself, but I have heard uh, numerous times where wet spots have been uh, opened up with cover crops. In other words, they had one or maybe two years where they had a really good cover crop that really rooted down, and then subsequently, years later, it was a little better. Now, uh, I'm not suggesting that cover crops are going to replace tile. Uh, I'm, I'm, there's, there's always extremes. There's always different situations with soil types and all kinds of different situations you could run into. But, Lloyd, I guess for your, your, uh, your question here, uh, there's no magic cover crop out there that you can plant, and it's going to solve your wet field problem. Uh, there isn't much better than hey, cereal. Cereal rye is one of the better ones. It's going to survive. So my answer is we just had an extreme year this year. So I think Ken wants to say something. Yeah, I would suggest that you do more than one multi-species. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to dry up to, to handle a wet area, not just one like cereal green, tree cow or rye, but what other two, would you uh, suggest, Ken? There. Well, obviously you want radish and then uh, like crimson clover, uh, maybe winter peas or something like that that would uh, grow something that's going to be actively growing all through the winter mm -hmm. or early spring. When, I, not the I'd winter. like to talk on this if I get a chance. Yep, go ahead, Cody. Yeah, so up, I don't know where you're located at, but up up here in the north, if we can get them established, if we can get brassicas and winter rye or, or triticale uh, established, I do know we need to get the rye seeded a little thicker in those lower spots. And what we've been able to do is um, it almost carries us over, but we've been able to get into wet spots earlier than normal because of those situations. Cause we actually have a, a, a lot of biomass to travel over and that's been very beneficial. Um, I'd actually rather go into a wet spot than a dry spot with some of that. Um, with some of the, the these cover crops because that can that's where we see the biggest benefit and we have a lot of heavy wet soil around me okay well that's that's interesting lloyd's actually here in pennsylvania not too far from me and we had a wet spring i think the thing about it is our wet spring came in may um right at planting time and and um mm -hmm. if that makes any difference i don't know but i'm um, just just saying for for well, our experience well, steve yeah, Steve, I got this is Dan. I've got two comments. Um, mm -hmm. Out here, we've had actually, and part of it is the timing when the wetness occurs. But mm -hmm. in December, or January, uh, we've actually lost the cereal rye in the low mm -hmm. spots. Okay, it, was, it couldn't take the water. Right. Uh, whereas annual ryegrass survived. Okay. But in regards to the spring, it it sounds like Lloyd was farmers again this is hindsight but probably if they had planted green and then sprayed the burn down you know if it was tall cereal rye uh you know you burn it down first you get that mat oh yeah it keeps raining and, and you're you're you know yeah but we <sighs> didn't burn down that was the plan we were going to plant green but we got so it got so wet uh we just couldn't get in and okay. then the, the, the rye actually matured So you're saying you you did not spray it, Lloyd, until you were able to plant? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, we. Uh, he's a. Uh, I had a cocktail last year mm -hmm. uh, in August. It was rye, radishes, uh, mm -hmm. clover, uh, crimson clover. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he had annual ryegrass. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think it was, yeah. it was a three-way. Yeah. And it, you know everything was looking good. And uh, and when the rains hit, uh, uh, you know, just got wet, and then the the rye matured, mm -hmm. and uh, it was that you know it was so thick it never dried out. I mean, everything matured, and mm -hmm. we couldn't get anything to dry. Let me ask mm -hmm. this, Lloyd. You know, no, I was. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say I was kind of in the same boat, uh, but I've been cover cropping a little bit earlier, and I was out planting corn, uh, you know, in five six foot rye this past mm -hmm. spring, and the first time I went green, mm -hmm. and uh, I was able, you know, the water was running off my tires. I mean, it was soaking wet. <laughs> uh, the the uh, openers were were mudding up. But uh, I was in and got it planted. Well, how does it look now, Lloyd? Uh, I'm going to say 80% of it looks excellent. It's, okay. uh, yep. Uh, there's some, I got spots that drowned yep. it out, and sure. you know, I got the except better, but about 80, 85% is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, seven, eight foot tall, starting to tassel and mm -hmm. in an excellent shape. Yeah. Now, getting back to your neighbor's story there. Who is wet forever uh, this spring? What traditionally, if we would have had a year like this with, and he would have planted no cover crop there, do you think he would have been ahead a at all in being able no, to plant? No, absolutely not. So okay, well, so then the cover yeah, crop I, was not a detriment. No, no, I don't think it was. I yeah. Uh, I I told him that I was on this uh, webinar and mm -hmm. I was going to ask the question if there were uh, certain things that he should look at. To plant uh, to enhance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, deep rooting, uh, you know, uh, and the ability for the ground to drain a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just have a I have very little experience with tile because we just don't need it in my area. We're well drained. That being said, I had a neighbor that I farmed, and it was like three acres that was just always wet. I mean, there's water running out of that field every spring almost. And a new owner bought it. I kept farming it, but they put tile in it. And and that certainly did make a huge difference. Uh, so there's, I, I guess I'm getting at, there is only so much cover crops can do. I certainly believe and know that they help. Uh, but when you yeah. had a wet spring I, like we did, there's, you know, we, we probably reached our limit there. But keep doing what he's doing. Uh, it's certainly not oh, going to make it worse. It's going to make it worse. That's, yeah. that's, that's I'm pretty confident in that. I'm pretty confident in that. So. Sounds Any, good. Anyone else? Herb, do you have anything to say? <laughs> I just had a question, Steve. I was at a seminar at Penn State last week, yeah. and um, yeah. this is going to be um, um, a question for radishes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we had um, um, Homestead plants a lot of radishes, and we had less bug pressure um, this year anyway but is there anybody out there that had serious bug pressure with radishes um in a year where most of the place is good well what when you say bugs could you be a little more specific well, what, when you say bugs could you be a little more specific um um i'm drawing a blank sorry steve um, okay okay <laughs> yeah i'll think of it in a second okay okay any other comments any from other anybody comments from anybody well, how about slugs? Let's go with slugs. let's go with slugs. Um, we beat that probably the, like a dead horse, but yeah. slug damage was not bad in Lancaster County this year. Right? Um, was it severe in other areas? I I generally heard that it was a it, it, in spite of all the conditions we had that were favorable for slugs, they just weren't here. They just weren't here. Uh, that's oh, pretty that's, much what what I've what I've been hearing. What I've, um, what I've been hearing. Oh, maybe because we had the cooler, we had the cooler colder winter, winter, I don't know. Colder winter, I don't know. Okay. I was thinking in reference to radishes and slugs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, sometimes we, we have more slug damage where we have radishes. Okay. Okay. Any other comments from anybody on radishes and slugs this year or any year or anything? 
Because I've heard both ways. I've heard that radishes increase slugs. I've heard that radishes decrease slugs. I think I've heard more so than not that it increases slugs. Uh, I do know that slugs do like brassicas. Actually, in um, France, they're using oil seed rape planted uh, with their corn. Sometimes they'll just broadcast it on as a uh, detractant for the slugs to keep the slugs distracted uh, so they don't eat the corn. Uh, I know that's just starting to be done. I tested it here in my farm this year. I planted oil seed rape in my, I have a 15 inch planter, so my 30 inch corn, I put oil seed rape and hairy vetch in the middles, but we didn't have any slug problems, so I didn't learn anything from that this year. Um, so anyway, any other questions that anybody may have? Any question? Well, hey, thanks for your great questions. Thanks for your attention. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a great week.